title of the message, The Authoritative Savior, part two. Didn't get to finish last time, so we'll jump back into this passage. The whole section runs from 828 down through 98, as we will see today. Who we understand rules the world at any given moment determines who we worship. Who we recognize as the sovereign determines who we trust in and obey. When we think about our decisions and, and when we're thinking about ourselves and we're independent and, and think everything revolves around us and our happiness, it becomes a controlling factor in our lives and we fail, and, uh, fail to honor and glorify the one who truly satisfies the soul. Today, we're going to get another glimpse of the sovereign ruler of the world. We will see the one who holds all things together by the word of his power. My prayer is, is that everyone here turns to him and renews your commitment to him and reminds your soul of the all-satisfying one the Lord Jesus, and that you find once again, and you are reminded once again of His glory. Last time we were in Matthew, we saw that we began this look at the displays of Jesus' authority, and we looked at two of the three displays of Jesus' authority that calls us to full commitment. We saw that Jesus is Lord over the environment. We saw that back in Verses 23 to 27. So the section actually starts back there in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 27. In this section, we saw that Jesus uh, was able to uh, calm the storm. You know, though he was asleep, they woke him up. He, he calmed the storm by just speaking and, and, and saying, be still. Then we saw in verses 28 to 34... Jesus is Lord over the evil ones. That the demon possessed uh, men that had a legion of demons, probably thousands of demons in them, uh, cried out to Jesus for him to cast them into the, the swine, and he cast them immediately into the swine, and they ran down and drowned themselves. And remember, the whole city acted like the demons previously and said, Leave our town, leave our area. Uh, recognizing that Jesus is Lord over the demonic realm. Today we're going to look at this third display of Jesus' authority. Jesus is Lord over the effects of sin in verses 1 to 8. Here we see Jesus moves back across the Sea of Galilee. We see this in verse 1. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. This area that he was probably talking about uh, was not his hometown where he had been raised, like Nazareth, but it was the area where he had done most of his ministry, right on the edge or right on the coast, Capernaum, probably. In our passage today, we see there are three ways that Jesus displays his lordship over the effects of sin. And these, play, uh, these uh, displays should motivate us all to seek and depend upon Jesus Always. We'll see that Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. Something we probably all kind of take for granted, but something we need to think on. And second, we will see Jesus has the authority to evaluate and expose hearts. He can look right into our souls and know exactly what we're thinking and, and call us to repentance and call us to look to Him. And then third, we'll see that Jesus has the authority to heal sicknesses. And the illnesses, like what we saw with Todd this week. Todd was perfectly healed this week. <laughs> what a great God he is. Though Todd struggled with cancer for two years and fought it for a long time, and we prayed, by the grace of God, Todd is no longer suffering with cancer because Jesus has healed him because of God's great glory. That's good news, isn't it? Let's start with this first point, though. Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. 
Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it states, And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, that is, their faith, Jesus, that is, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. The setting here is one that is very common throughout the Gospels. That is, you have someone with an illness, a, a very bad illness. He was a paralytic man called palsy in the King James Version of the Bible. It appears that he couldn't walk or even sit up. He laid on a mat and was carried around by his friends and family. If you can just put yourself in for just a second into his shoes for a minute and think on that, that would be a very difficult life, wouldn't it, to be put in this situation. The paralytic was lying on a bed or a, 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 a mat that they would carry him around. He was completely dependent upon his friends and family to care for him. This was truly a difficult life to have, wouldn't it be? A very hard situation to be in. The other gospel accounts in Mark chapter 2 verses 3 to 12 and Luke chapter 5 verses 18 to 26 give us more detail. Jesus was in a packed house, a house with lots and lots of people. Included in there were some scribes, some religious elites and there was really no way to enter the room. There was no way to get this man that was on that mat in to see Jesus so that Jesus could heal him because the place was packed out with people. So what happened is, is his friends or family took this man and put him up on the roof. Can you imagine what this would have been terrifying, being lifted up on top of the roof, and they dig down into the roof in order to set him down in between and in front of Jesus in order to have him healed. Luke 5.19 talks about this. They found no way to get him in there, so the crowd was too much, so they invented a new way. They dug the roof out and let him down in there. You can see their faith, can't you? That just by thinking on this and this concept, they believed Jesus could heal them, and they were going to get him in front of Jesus no matter what. They sought his healing. Some speculate, because when you read the passage, you, it might hint at this, that the man's condition was based on a sin he had done. It says, because you know Jesus says, your sin is forgiven. Honestly, though, every time I've read the passages, it, it doesn't specifically say that. It's kind of reading in between the lines. Or reading all three accounts, we can't say for sure that the condition was a result of a specific sin. In other words, he hadn't gotten drunk sometime and... And, and fallen down and broke his back, and so he was on this mat. It, it doesn't give us all those details, and we really can't speculate. We, we do know this, though. We live in a sin-filled world, don't we? And we've done things and hurt ourselves by what we've done that was wrong, right? Everybody in the room would say, yep, that's me. I've done that before. But at the same time, just living in this world, we are still sinners, and the world itself is cursed, and there's all kinds of things that happen to us, right? So his condition could have been from a specific sin that he had done, or, or, or probably just he was like that. He lived in a cursed world, and he had gotten injured. Or maybe he was even born that way. Others think that Jesus saw the paralytic, was more concerned with his own sin than his condition. And the reason why they would presume that is why. He, he's let down and the first thing that comes out of Jesus' mouth is what? Your sins are forgiven. So is it possible that the man, as he was being lit, laid down in front of Jesus, he goes, man, I can't believe I'm even in the presence of Jesus. And in his heart, he's thinking, I'm a sinner. Why should I be here? And Jesus forgives him. All these things are possible. We don't know. There's not specific details that are, are given there. We do know that Jesus goes right out forgiveness, right? And that's the first thing he addresses. So this may be true, but we also can't assume that. 
Friends, when we read this passage, we can often read over just the, the simple profound truth that's right there in front of us. Look what Jesus says. He says, take courage. Be encouraged, child, son. Your sins are forgiven. The, the compassion of our Savior oozes from his dis- declaration. Oh, I'm so thankful that there's words like this in the Bible. How about you? It shows that we have a Savior that forgives our sin. You say, well, yeah, Mike, that's why we're here this morning. But we kind of take that for granted, don't we? Stop, think for a second. We have a Savior that forgives sin. That's good news. That's great news. First and foremost, Jesus sees the man needs forgiveness. And he needs to be affirmed that he is forgiven. So he speaks, your sins are forgiven. Do we realize just how glorious this statement is? This man's sins are forgiven. Jesus saw his faith and pronounced that the paralytic sins were forgiven. If we understand just how sinful we are, these words are some of the most glorious words ever spoken. The possibility that me and you can be forgiven. That should make all of us stand and shout, Glory, right? We can be forgiven. This paralytic man is more like us than we all may think at first glance. Do you understand? He had a physical illness, but worse, he, like all of us, was born a sinner. He needed a savior, a deliverer, a redeemer. And Jesus was that rescuer. You know, friends, it's easy for us to take for take our greatest need and and our circumstances and put them at the top of our priority list. Do you find yourself doing this? I don't know about you, but this is me. Something happens in my life, a, an event or a struggle or a difficulty that's going on around me, and that becomes my obsession. That becomes all I can see. That's all I can think about. And so profound truths... Oh, yeah, 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 that's a nice little side note. But my circumstances, my life, my hardship, that's the most important thing. Anybody else like me on this? And it gets elevated so high that it's all my prayers. How about you? Does that happen to you in your prayers? It becomes everything to me. And I'm like, well, God, won't you fix this? How about this? This problem? This person? This situation? This sickness? This hurting? But our primary need Every day, do you hear me? Listen closely, is forgiveness. Our primary need is forgiveness. Remember, those who have been born again, yes, we're justified, we're declared right, we're forgiven because of what Christ did. But it doesn't change the fact that our relationship, we don't enjoy him to the fullest because of sin in our hearts and in our lives that we still fight daily, don't we? Constantly reminded of this. The, the, the man on the bed didn't say, wait, 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 wait. Forget the sin and forgiveness. I want to get up and walk. The biggest problem in our hearts and in our lives, folks, is not how somebody's treating us. It's not what's going on in politics. It's not what's happening around in our world. The biggest problem that we have is our hearts. And the sin that's continually harassing us. Every one of us in the room, we need to hear your sins 
are forgiven. When we were reading that psalm, what, didn't it, wasn't it so encouraging? That your sins are taken away as far as it is from the east to the west. Forgiveness is a glorious truth, isn't it? And yet we read over a passage like this and say, oh, it's really not that important. That's not the main thing. But it is, isn't it? All of our sin is paid for. And if you're here and you're not saved, you haven't been born again, you haven't turned to Christ, your sins aren't forgiven. And that is a bigger issue than anything else. If you're an unbeliever and you haven't turned and repented and believed in Christ, turn to Him today because that's your biggest need by far more than anything. We need forgiveness every day, all the time. God is holy. God is just. And He created us. And God sustains us. But we are sinful. And we are fleshly. And our flesh constantly is distracting us. We often fail to thank and praise the very ones, the very one that we were made to thank and praise. But God provided a Savior. And he revealed his commitment to providing forgiveness for sin when Jesus said these words, Son, your sins are forgiven. When he says these words, you understand what that means. It sealed his death. He would die because that's the only way forgiveness could happen. And he would die for the very one that was laying in front of him, the man that was on a mat. Jesus says, take courage. Your sins are forgiven. He didn't specifically say it here, but Jesus' words guaranteed that he would die for sin. Forgiveness is only found in the propitiation of God's wrath. You understand that. That's a fact. These words should have shocked the crowd. <laughs> Not because Jesus was saying it and they were afraid that he was blaspheming because that's not true. He wasn't. But they should have said, wait a second, how is forgiveness accomplished? There has to be a sacrifice. They should have fallen on their faces and said, wait, there's a man that's saying forgiveness is possible. Their theology was pretty bad though, wasn't it? They didn't get it. With these words the to, to the paralytic, Jesus says, in effect, I am Lord over the effects of sin. I will be the atonement for your sin. I will provide a righteous sacrifice for your sin. You have hope. And the good news, Jesus provides that same forgiveness to any of us who believe in him. I was at the funeral yesterday, and as, a, the, uh, as the preacher was going, he was talking about how the gospel. And I don't know about you guys, it, it, it lit me on fire. And I was so excited as he began to talk about the glory of the gospel again, reminded of what Christ has done. It never gets old, does it? It's so great to know that every sin I've ever done is paid for in what Christ did. He died, he rose, he lives, and I live because of what Christ did. This is glorious truth. It never gets old, does it? And if it gets old, what's happened is we don't see how sinful we really are. If the gospel is old, you've forgotten just how barbaric your sin is in light of a holy God. This is good news. Jesus provides forgiveness for the paralytic. He believed. So what must we do? Exactly what the paralytic did. Pursue the Savior. Even if it requires radical steps, how many of us are willing to go and get let down from the roof into the room so we can seek and know Him? We have a hard time seeking Him and we have Bibles all over our house, don't we? 
But we are blessed, beloved. We have a vision. We have a glimpse. We have a revelation of God in the Word of God. And we can know Him and enjoy Him forever and ever because He has provided it for us. What must we do? We must seek Him, not just once in your life. You seek Him all the time, don't we? We seek Him every day. And our loving Savior always responds with the same message. Your sins are forgiven. He says to us, take courage, my children. Your sins are forgiven. Beloved, we live in a sinful world, don't we? Has it saddened you this week watching all the stuff going on? Or maybe you've become so hardened to it or so callous by it, you say, well, I'm not even going to turn the TV on. I can't even read anything because it just absolutely destroys my soul. I would understand that. I've been saddened this week by the overwhelming hypocrisy on display in our world. And it comes at us from every direction. And I want you to listen closely. I'm, I'm, I'm not making a stance on a particular man. I'm not even talking about that. We are all sinful. There are no good men. Do you understand that? None. You say, well, Mike, yeah, there's good men. Well, compared to what? Compared to the only good man, Jesus Christ, none of us are good. None of us. And by the way, just to be full disclosure, there's no good women either. Love you, ladies, but it's a fact. Women are not more righteous than men. Do you understand? Sorry. Men are not more righteous than women. You know what we all are? Totally depraved sinners. Every one of us apart from the grace of God. It's grieving, isn't it? We had a week-long debate over whether a particular man was evil or good. I'm not speaking about the guilt or innocence of that man. But sadly, the debate actually created a bigger problem. Everyone was adjudicating on everyone else. We all did this, didn't we? We all made a judgment. How many of you made a judgment call on the issue? Let me ask you a question. Did you evaluate your heart as much as you evaluated the guy on the TV screen? Ouch. Or did we evaluate the lady as much as we evaluated our own hearts? Do you see how easy it is to fall into this mentality that we're always doing what? Adjudicating on everybody else. You know what really needs to happen in our country? We all need to adjudicate our own hearts. We all need to fall on our faces and cry out to a living God. We, every one of us, including myself, need to cry out, God have mercy on us, the sinners. That's what really needs to happen. The good news is, is that we have a Savior. We have a Savior that anyone who comes to Him, He will forgive. Anyone who believes in him, they will be considered righteous by grace through faith in Christ alone. You understand, if we were all judged on the basis of God's righteous standard, <laughs> we all are what? Guilty. Kind of go to the side anymore, do they? When you read, your sins are forgiven. We go, that's good news. Now I want to warn all of you. 
If we fail to see our sins, our own sins, we will fail to recognize who we really need, Jesus. This was the problem of the scribes in the house with Jesus. Look back at our passage. They had the solution for their sins in their midst. They had the solution for their sins in the same room with them. That's amazing. But instead, what did they do? They accused the solution for their sins of what? Blasphemy. You know what this is? There's no other way I can say it. Sin makes you stupid. It's a fact. You've got the God-man right in your midst. The one who would die. Isaiah 53 incarnate in front of you. And you say, he's blaspheming. It's shocking, isn't it? It's shocking until we realize our own self-righteous hearts. But we often adjudicate on everybody else, but we don't look at our own hearts. Notice, Jesus demonstrates his lordship over this effects of sin. And the second idea, Jesus has the authority to evaluate and expose hearts. Jesus observed the faith of the paralytic and his helpers. He knew it was genuine faith because he had proclaimed that the young man or the man was forgiven of his sins. Beloved, Jesus knows our hearts too, doesn't he? He knows whether we rely, we're relying upon him or ourselves. He knows whether our faith is from our hearts that are born again or whether we're faking it. <laughs> we're just acting. He knows whether we're genuine believers. He also is able to evaluate and expose any unbelief in all of us. He's able to do it. That's what our trials often do, don't they? Those trials in our life come into the play, and then what do we do? They reveal whether we're really trusting God, right? They show whether or not we really exalt and honor and trust in the sovereign lordship in our life, don't they? We know that from the parable of the soils, right? That there's those happy, great joys that come up, those ones that spring up instantly but then fade away, that's not genuine belief. Or those that embrace the Lord, it appears embrace the, embrace the word, but as trials and difficulties come, they strangle out. They die. Beloved, Jesus saw true faith. He knew who he had given grace to. And this man laid down, layered down right in front of him. He says, your sins are forgiven. But in 3.5, we see, 9.3 rather, Three to five. It says, and some of the scribes said to themselves, this fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Wow, do you see something very profound in this little paragraph, in this little section? It's interesting. The scribes were blind to the glory of the one who was in their midst. Their darkened hearts called good evil and evil good. Notice the scribes themselves said, this man blasphemes. This fellow blasphemes. They said to themselves, I actually like the King James Version's translation better here. They said within themselves. They said within themselves. The reason is context. Notice Matthew explains and Jesus knowing their thoughts. So it appears what? Look, do you understand how profound this is? Can you imagine if you're in a room and you're self-righteously judging that person? Okay, you're, you're thinking, man, this guy's wicked. I'm better than him. He's evil. He's blaspheming God. And all of a sudden, you're just thinking it within yourself. All of a sudden, he looks to you and says, 
Why are you thinking evil in your heart? What? What do you mean? I, I, I'm not thinking evil in my heart. <laughs> that, would, that would be crazy, wouldn't it? Any of y'all know how to read minds? Don't raise your hand. None of us. Why? Because only God does that. The God-man looked into their hearts and saw that they were evil had evil thoughts. You know what should have happened at this moment? What should have happened? At that very moment, they should have fell on their face immediately. They should have said, Whoa, I'm undone. Be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. What happened when Isaiah saw the Lord? He was undone. What did he do? Woe is me. The God-man was in this room. He pronounced forgiveness. And then he exposes the evil hearts of the self-righteous who were looking at on and saying, you're blaspheming. Beloved, only God knows our hearts. And he knows our hearts right now. This should bring a healthy fear of the Lord for every one of us in the room. Shouldn't it? How many of you had an evil thought this week? You don't need to raise your hand. God already knows it. He saw it when you did it. Wow. Jesus reveals his authority and his supremacy by exposing the evil of the scribe's heart. Do you see the irony in this thing too? It's amazing. They accused the Lord God incarnate of what? Blasphemy. By accusing him of blasphemy, what are they actually doing? They're blaspheming. They're actually doing the very thing that they're accusing him of doing. The ultimate of what? Hypocrisy. Oh, beloved, listen. Every one of us needs to be aware that we can have the same propensity. How many of you live with a sinner? Don't raise your hand. Let, let me ask you a question. How many of you see the sin in your spouse more than you see the sin in yourself? Maybe just your roommate? Or maybe it's everybody that you work with. Man, I, I don't want to find myself being like this. Do you? I know I do. What do we need? A Savior. We need forgiveness. Friends, there's nothing we can hide from the Lord. Nothing. He sees all, knows all, and will expose all. Are you like me? I find it hard to tell who's telling the truth all the time, right? By the way, how many of you want 37 years ago of your life, some of you aren't even 37, to be brought into the public? I was like, man, I don't want to be this guy. You know what's worse? What if all of our thoughts that we've ever had were laid bare? <laughs> I don't think any of us would come out of the house. What do you think? If we really knew what was going on in all of our hearts, we'd all probably be crawling around on the ground begging God, please, please have mercy on us. All too often we think we're way better than we really are. And it's that deflection that happens in our hearts. And that's exactly what's happening with these self-righteous scribes. 
One thing we can know for sure, the Lord knows the truth, right? He knows everything about us. Jesus knows exactly what we've done every second of the day, of every minute of our entire life. Shocking truth. He knows your worst moments and your best moments. And if you had a best moment, you had a best moment because he helped you have a best moment. I promise it was his grace, not you. He gets all the credit for the good stuff, doesn't he? We get all the credit for the what? The bad stuff. That's me. He knows our best and our worst moments. He knows our most evil thoughts and our most glorifying thoughts. I want to warn all of us when we come to moments like this in our lives, when everyone is trying to evaluate others' motives and intentions, remember your own heart. I think that was the one thing that kind of stood up to me. I was convicted of this message and everything at the same time. I'm watching this poor guy. Oh, sorry, I gave an insinuation there, but I wouldn't want to be go through what he went through. I watched this and thought to myself, oh, me. I wouldn't want to be him. I would not want to be him. Again, I wouldn't want to be in her situation either. But God knows my heart. And I was reminded, I need Jesus. All the time. Maybe our hearts won't be exposed to the world. Maybe people won't know us for who we really are. Maybe we can hide it. But God knows. Be careful of hypocrisy. That's rampant in all of us. We judge others' motives, but God sees through our self-righteousness. So Jesus says to them to expose them. Your sins, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or say, get up and walk. No, I, I got to thinking about that. Which one is easier? <laughs> well, your sins are, e are forgiven is not really easy either. It's a pronouncement, but it implied what? His death, so that wasn't easy. Get up or walk. Well, he did make the body, and he can make the body do whatever he wants to make the body do, can he? Is he a great physician? Yep, he can. He, could, he can fix anything just by saying it. But his point is what? Only God can do that. And he's saying, if I have the authority and can do this, then I have the authority to forgive sin. Which means what? You better believe in me. You better trust me. Both of these actions are limited to only God. Only God can forgive sin and only God can heal people. If he does this miracle, then the first pronouncement is legitimate also. So when he healed him, immediately said he's able to grant forgiveness. Jesus is so much better than any human that's ever walked the earth. You understand that? He's the only God-man. The one we should all worship. So Jesus moves to show his authority to do both. Look, third, and finally, Jesus has the authority to heal sickness. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin, then he said to the par paralytic, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he got up and went home. That's called a miracle. Jesus again referred to himself with the title which identified him as with his humanity, the Son of Man. Again, showing his humility and taking on flesh, in order to be the fulfillment of all that the Bible talked about of a, prof, of, a, of a Messiah who would come and save mankind from their sin. But he revealed his identity as a representative of mankind and said it wasn't limited to only Son of Man by doing the miracle. 
He was also saying, I am the Lord. That's what he's doing. I am the Lord. He had authority on earth to heal and to forgive. He speaks and the paralytic is instantly healed. He ordered the man to get up and go home. And what did the man do? He got up and went home. And the man did just like that. This was a great day for the paralytic, wasn't it? It was an amazing day. His illness was cured, but also he had assurance that all of his sins were paid for, for forgiven. He was forgiven. I'm fairly sure that this was the best day of this man's life. What do you think? What a day! With this miracle, Jesus emphatically reveals he is the Lord. It again, reminds me of the funeral yesterday. And so Todd, when he passes away, he had his best day the day he died. It was his best day because that was the day he saw his Savior. That was the day all cancer was gone. What a good day. <laughs> Jesus displays his authority over the effects of sin. What does it produce? Listen, friends, listen. How many of you want to worship God? <laughs> Raise your hand. How many of you want to worship God? You ready? This is how you worship God. You realize... That God has forgiven you. You realize that the Lord Jesus is the Savior who came into the earth to provide forgiveness and healing. That causes us to worship. Notice in verse 8 But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. They were awestruck. They were, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> he has authority to what? Both heal and forgive. And they magnified God. They glorified God. They honored God. What's the chief end of man, as we talked about in Sunday school? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever? How do we do this? When we understand who He is. When we recognize how great he is, then worship comes. In me, some joy, do I have to muster it up? Let's go ahead. Everybody smile. Do I have to somehow, okay, I'm going now to worship and rejoice in the Lord. Yay! Is this how I do it? I grin and bear my teeth and I smile at you even when I don't want to smile. I know I look like a crazy man, but I'm trying to make a point. What's my point? Worship, glorifying God, rejoicing in Him doesn't come by flipping a switch in your soul. It doesn't come by mustering it up somehow saying, okay, it's time. Click the switch. Time to worship. A mighty fortress is my God. No. That's not how you do it. It's when you get a glimpse of him. Did you hear me? It's when you get a glimpse of Him. We can't create worship if we're not enjoying and seeing a display of Him. Do you have a hard time worshiping during the week, maybe? Is it possible that you're not looking at Him? You're not spending time with Him. It's really hard 
when everything is hitting you and you are being distracted by everything else, for you to just all of a sudden say, Jesus is good. But when you see a passage like this and you meditate on a passage like this, do you know what I'm doing right now? I'm worshiping. I have the best job. You know why I have the best job? Because I'm forced to study the Bible every week. Amazing. It's great. Can you believe it? And then you know what I get to do? Stand up here and act like a crazy man. You know why I get to do that? Because I can't help it. I know some of y'all see me. You're looking at me during the week and you're saying, man, you look real tired. What's wrong with you? The problem is, is that I'm just like you guys. There's a million distractions and a million things that are trying to grab me from basking in the glory of God. I'm no different than you. But talk to me as I'm meditating on the word of God. And it's a whole different person. I'm awestruck by God. How about you? It's not that we don't know how to worship, beloved. Everybody in this room probably knows how to worship. The problem is, is we're not looking to him. We're not seeking him. We're not enjoying and delighting and abiding in him. The crowd got a glimpse. But the crowd still didn't really get it, did they? Because if the crowd really got it, who had given a th- such authority to men, they would have said, wait a second, let me ask you another question, Jesus. <laughs> How did you get this authority? And Jesus' answer would have been, before Abraham existed, I am. <laughs> and then what would have happened? Hopefully, they would have fell on their faces. Instead, the crowds, even the disciples, abandoned him. And he was crucified on the cross. As they cried out, crucify him. Crucify him. We've seen in this section, Jesus is Lord over the environment. Jesus is Lord over evil ones. And Jesus is Lord over the effects of sin. You have one response. Go worship your Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your kindness towards us. We thank you for Christ, what he did for us, who he is, that forgiveness is found in him. Father, we pray that you expose our hearts, show us where we need you. And help us, Father, to abide in you to look to Christ, to seek Him, to ask for forgiveness. Father, we do pray right now, we cry out to You, please forgive us for our sins, for those thoughts this week that we did that did not honor You, for our hearts that were constantly distracted by the things of the world, for our, our our, our continuous strain and seeking after finding joy in everything but you. God, please forgive us for this sin. Please help us, Lord, to abide in you, to think on you, to meditate on you, to enjoy you and to worship you around the world, all the time, wherever we go. Keep you in our forefront of our minds. Please, Lord, we need you. We need you. We love you. We pray all this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ the Lord.